Only the startled cries of waterfowl and the muted lapping of muddy waters against a sudden foreshore disturbed the solitude. As 156 years ago, William Blanchard, with three fellow veterans of the War of 1812, paddled across the Illinois River from bustling Fort Clark to settle on this nameless, waterlogged wasteland. Over the next few years, a trickle of hardy pioneers were to follow him across the river. Constructing crude cabins for themselves, they eked a livelihood from the marshy soil. The arrival of these early settlers marked the first in a series of events which were to transform that inhospitable wilderness into the vital, pulsating city of East Peoria as we know it today. This soaring freeway, I-74, straddling the low-lying landscape with mighty legs of steel and concrete, swiftly carries the unwitting traveler over a region steeped in the past. This present-day site of East Peoria Central Junior High School marks the location of a historic farm. This land was once owned by David Schertz, a French settler from Alsace-Lorraine. Schertz spent the winter of 1831 at Fort Clark. In the spring of 1832, Schertz, fording the Illinois River at Wesley, moved his family from the secure confines of the fort to the swampy wilderness of the Farm Creek Valley. The 160 acres of land which he purchased from the United States government was issued under a deed signed by President Andrew Jackson. Here, where the massive freeway now dominates the skyline, Schertz found an abandoned log cabin and a little patch of corn. Who had begun the humble attempts at settlement, no one knows. Nevertheless, Schertz, not having seen corn before, was at a loss to know what to do with it. As he tilled the soil to establish his modest farm, no doubt he learned the secrets of this unfamiliar land with its strange crops from Blanchard and his other neighbors who had already established themselves at nearby Fond du Lac, a name meaning bottom of the lake. Life was difficult, yet fulfilling for the resolute pioneers. Still, as fall yellowed the land, tragedy was to strike the Schertz family. Their five-year-old son, Peter, was playing outdoors one day when his mother noticed that he was intently digging a hole under a tree and asked him what he was doing. He quietly replied, I'm digging my grave because I'm going to die tonight. As Peter had always been a healthy child, his mother told him not to talk so foolishly. But true to his strange premonition, Peter was soon to die. His grave became the first in a small cemetery near Central Junior High School where 22 other East Peoria pioneers were buried. In the years that followed, the land adjacent to the Schertz farm attracted other settlers from Alsace-Lorraine, who farmed the soggy soil with difficulty. The mosquito-infested swamps around them invited fever, while heavy rainfall brought the threat of devastating flash floods. But meanwhile, farmers on the plateau to the east were prospering, producing hogs and corn. David Schertz, recognizing a need, built a mill on a stream located on this property. It was here that farmers from outlying areas, after their wearying journey to town, were offered the congeniality of Mrs. Schertz's kitchen and a comfortable night's lodging as their corn was ground and their horses rested. Nothing remains today of this hospitable old mill. With the draining of the land in later years, even the mill stream has disappeared, and houses line this street where once it flowed. Markers attached to utility poles identify the other streets in this area, but this street, carrying the historic Schertz name, sadly enough, has no such similar marker to identify it. Along with the agricultural development of this rural area came the second major means of support, coal mining. Across the way from the site of the old Schertz farm and mill, mining companies began burrowing into the nearby bluffs, extracting coal and clay to support the needs of the growing community. Here again, there remains little, if any, evidence of coal mines and shafts. 
Historic documents tell us that slag heaps from the slope mining covered much of the ground, making it impossible to locate any of the old mine shafts. It was here, somewhere near the site of these modern-day East Peoria churches, that a cemetery once stood, the same cemetery where young Peter Schurz was reported to have been buried. Unfortunately, a slag heap from the Dooley Brothers Coal Company exceeded its boundaries along the fence line farther up the bluff and covered the entire area. Walking through the bluffs, observing the eroded hillsides, one can only imagine what this site looked like during the era of industrial slope and shaft mining. What purpose did this antiquated structure serve in its day? Could it be a crumbling relic of the coal mining era? Or did it once serve another equally important industry? A strata of clay underlining the seam of coal was also extracted. This clay was baked into bricks, meeting the demands of the local building industry. Now the intersection of Pekin Avenue and State Route 24, this site used to be the location of the F.R. Carter Brickyard. Another industry, the Can Brothers Brickyard, was located approximately one-fourth mile southwest of the Carter Works. The Carter firm later moved to a new location on Coal Hollow Road. Yet the days of the coal and brick industries, so vital to the early development of the area, were numbered. Eventually, with the addition of strip mining in nearby counties, the early coal mines in East Peoria, which provided for a largely local need, would become too expensive an operation to continue. Yet at one time in the early development of East Peoria, these coal mines, serving as an inducement to further industry and the future development of railroads, supported the industrial base of the Schertz Farm area. Gradually, this area came to be known as Blue Town. Several explanations for the origin of this name have been given. First, the stilt-legged houses of the early settlers were painted blue in an effort to counteract the corrosive elements of the swamp on which they were built. Second, these inhabitants were largely from Alsace-Lorraine, where it was customary for the men to wear the blue smocks of their native homeland. A third explanation was that a large number of these houses were painted blue by a mining company to signify its ownership. Blue Town was now largely self-supporting and even exporting some of its corn, hogs, coal, and bricks. To be shipped out, these goods were carried to the Illinois River at neighboring Wesley City. This quiet backwater with its little cottages drowsing in the sun and its feet gently lapped by the stiller reaches of the river is one of the most historic locations on the eastern banks of the Illinois. It was here that LaSalle landed in 1680 and climbed the bluffs to establish Fort Creve Corps. The Indians here were friendly to LaSalle and sought his protection from the warlike Iroquois. He, in turn, sought their help in constructing his ill-fated fort. After its destruction, the Indians continued to trade with the French, exchanging their furs for the white man's artifacts at Beeson's old trading post at Wesley. These bartering sessions, conveniently located near the shrewd trader's riverside crossroads, would anticipate Wesley's later role as a transportation hub. From early times, wagons and coaches could travel this road running from Springfield to Galena, and here where the river narrows and becomes more shallow, the early traveler was able to ford the stream when its waters were low. By 1824, a ferry plied from bank to bank. In 1836, Wesley was planted, becoming the first area town east of the river. By the 1840s, a stagecoach line was carrying passengers back and forth, making an important stop at Wesley. The railroad, which was to come in 1872, would complete Wesley's role as a transportation center. Even today, Wesley remains a cushion between modes of transportation, with barges nosing into the quiet riverfront while railroad tracks pass behind. Wesley's planting in 1836 was followed by the mapping of Fond du Lac in 1855. With the additional planting of Blue Town in 1864, the east side of the river was nearly ready for the rapid commercial development, which would soon follow. This low-lying mire presented so many problems to the would-be settler that for many years, growth was impeded. So why had the early settlers chosen to inhabit the swampy foreshores when superior farmland lay to the east? In early days, when roads were few, the river was the basic means of transportation, and the newcomers were forced to settle close to it. Thus, East Peoria's pioneers chose the marshy mud flats of the Farm Creek Fan rather than the more suitable hinterlands. Mosquitoes and other disease-carrying insects brought fevers and sickness to the struggling community whose very existence was threatened time and again by the ravages of swift, destructive floods. But the settlers' faith in the place they had chosen to make their home would one day be vindicated. Men of vision and imagination would later come to the area and visualize the potential of this seemingly unfavorable site. One of these was a hardy steamboat captain, 
Almiron Cole. Cole, a man of considerable business ability, had trekked with his wife and two-year-old son in a wagon stocked with merchandise from Massachusetts to Peoria late in 1835. Before long, he had established himself in a flourishing mercantile business and began seeking other ways to augment his growing fortune. He began acquiring large tracts of land on the east side of the river, building his first distillery near this farm in 1844. Late in the 1860s, Captain Cole moved his family to one of the East Peoria farms. Looking over his muddy empire, Cole foresaw great factories and prosperous industries one day rising on the marshland. However, for this vision to be realized, a better method of linking East Peoria and its sister city to the west was necessary. The cumbersome ferries which had plied across the river were becoming inadequate as the population of the area increased. Captain Cole, sensing this need, built the first toll bridge and the toll road leading to it in 1848. The following year it was carried away by ice only to be rebuilt and opened a few months later. Bad luck dogged the bridge over the next few years. In 1852, the swing was carried away by the steamboat Amazonia, and at various times, span, trestle, and once more, the swing had to be rebuilt. In 1886, Cole sold his toll road and bridge to the city of Peoria, which made it free to the public. Cole's bridge made it possible for people on the east side of the river to seek work in Peoria. Today, these bridges still provide a vital link between the two cities. Cole's civic interest and enthusiasm have been memorialized in East Peoria in names such as Cole Street, Cole Edition, Cole Hollow, and Coleville, while Johnson Street, Everett Street, and Elmwood, now called Almiron Street, were named for his descendants. Cole's gracious townhouse once stood on the corner of Washington and Cole Streets, where this Methodist church stands today. Set in a garden dotted with stately elms and oaks and surrounded by a white picket fence, it was one of East Peoria's earliest show places. This tall granite column in Springdale Cemetery marks the last resting place of this visionary pioneer. On Cole's death in 1891, his hometown had witnessed a considerable expansion. Seven years earlier, Coleville, emerging as the heart of the business district, combined with Bluetown, taking a new name, Hilton. In October of 1889, the area was again renamed, this time becoming the Village of East Peoria. This was a period of awakening and growth for the sleepy rural settlement. The railroad had penetrated this area, largely replacing the slow and sometimes hazardous river traffic. In 1857, trains were checking between East Peoria and Chinoa, Illinois, and later that same year, they began crossing the Illinois River into Peoria. Two important railroads had lines running across this fertile heartland of Illinois. The Toledo, Peoria, and Western, along with the Peoria and Pekin Union, became a tremendous influence in securing for East Peoria the new industries of which Cole had dreamed.
In the early 1900s, with a growing number of people traveling back and forth over Almiron Coles Bridge, it became obvious that some form of local public transportation was also necessary. Oliver Hansen started the first hack line, and others were to follow him. Four times a day, these colorful old horse-drawn vehicles made their run from Peter Schertz's store to the little waiting room at the Peoria end of the bridge. Here, the passengers would cross the railroad tracks on Water Street to go about their business in Peoria's retail district. Passengers wishing to board the hack would run to their gates upon hearing the jingle of the bell which heralded its arrival. Even though the trip could be quite breathtaking due to the deep mud-filled ruts created by heavy coal wagons, the East Peorians thoroughly enjoyed their trip, exchanging snippets of gossip and snuggling close to the hack's little stove chimney on chilly winter days. Shortly after the turn of the century, a line of motor surreys began running from Peoria. These high, handsome vehicles, sporting fluttering fringes around their tops and great wooden-spoked wheels, carried several passengers who climbed three good steps from the ground to board them. Sadly, these jaunty vehicles could not compete with the hacks. Two strong horses did a better job of pulling through the quagmire, so they were destined to disappear from the scene. Now the village of East Peoria, served by hacks, bridges and trains, was ready for commercial and industrial development. The principal figure in this endeavor was the ambitious lawyer, realtor, and philanthropist, Oliver J. Bailey. A native of New York State, O.J. Bailey first set foot on Illinois soil in 1848. Twenty-eight years later, Bailey's work with the Aetna Life Insurance Agency as Attorney General brought him to Peoria. He settled across the river at this stately Peoria residence. Yet, like his predecessor, Almiron Cole, Bailey took a special interest in the growth and expansion of East Peoria. He foresaw great possibilities for this swampy Farm Creek fan, located so conveniently on the river. The first civic project Bailey undertook in an effort to lure the industrialists from across the river to East Peoria was the paving of the wagon road which led to Almiron Cole's bridge. The road was said to have been paved with brick. Today, this concrete road, which slices through the heart of Caterpillar towards the Franklin Street Bridge, seems hardly historic. Yet in 1901, this community improvement was labeled the event which pulled East Peoria out of the mud. Bailey's road improvements opened the way for the coming of the streetcars. The children and the baseball fans loved to ride these iron monsters, gliding smoothly from place to place on shining rails, their electric poles splashing the twilight sky with sulfurous green stars. On lazy summer days, several streetcars linked together would carry an exuberant crowd of holidaymakers to the Sunday school picnic in Glen Oak Park. The leisurely ride took more than an hour, allowing the singing, laughing passengers ample time to soak in the sights and sounds along the way. Nowadays, sealed in our air-conditioned automobiles, we whisk over the self-same route in 10 or 15 minutes, scarcely noticing the scenery so swiftly flashing by. The arrival of the streetcars turned people's attention to the need for a new bridge to replace the one built by Almiron Cole, which once more was in need of extensive repairs. Plans for this new bridge were formulated, and solid concrete approaches were built on either side of the river. However, legal complications halted the work, and eventually the approaches were demolished. A few years later, a very beautiful bridge was built. This graceful arch of concrete curving over the river was opened with due pomp and ceremony. But a few days later, without warning, it quietly crumbled into the swift water below. After this embarrassing fiasco, construction began on the sturdy Franklin Street Bridge, which is still serving us so well today. While O.J. Bailey was busy pulling East Peoria out of the mud, the Peoria Gas and Electric Company was pulling East Peoria out of the dark. In 1903, franchises for electric lights, gas, power, and heat were granted to Peoria Gas and Electric. Cooking with gas became a household slogan as crews began the tedious work of laying gas pipes and electricity lines to the community residents. The Peoria Gas and Electric Company soon became the Central Illinois Light Company, a flourishing business with luxurious new showrooms displaying their modern gas stoves and heaters. There was much work to be done as the company grew in size and the demands for gas and electricity from the community increased. An ambitious Silco crew stands proudly by their vehicles as they prepare for a busy day of laying pipe and lines to reach the community residents as well as the outlying farmers. Much of their time was spent on the installation and repair of street lights and electricity lines. Some were fortunate enough to be involved in the laying of the first submarine cable across the Illinois. Looking towards the future, Silco businessmen made plans for the building of a new plant on the Farm Creek Fan. 
O.J. Bailey, a businessman with a keen perception of the law and shrewd farsightedness, had purchased much of the surrounding land on the Farm Creek Fan. The Voris Farm, a large expanse of land lying adjacent to the Illinois River, was sold to Bailey in 1887. Bailey visualized this east side farm becoming the future industrial site of East Peoria. Making use of his legal expertise as well as his personal influence, Bailey arranged a proposal allowing industries to build factories on his land without the imposition of enormous corporate taxes. R. Herschel and Company from across the river in Peoria was the first of the industrialists to accept Bailey's offer. A sign above the new Herschel plant built in 1904 boldly told any curious passerby what went on inside this newest member of the East Peoria community. Through the years, the exterior as well as the interior of the R. Herschel plant underwent several changes. Today, the only remaining monument to this early East Peoria industry is this vacant building next to Caterpillar with the inscription R. Herschel and Company. The Colleen Manufacturing Company was quick to follow the lead of the Herschel Company. Responsible for manufacturing a variety of farm equipment, the Colleen Company became East Peoria's second major industry. A map of early East Peoria shows the nearness and location of these twin industries. Between the two companies, employment was provided for 500 men. Within this maze of factory buildings, which now house largely the business of Caterpillar Tractor Company, many other industries would come and go. Peoria Steel and Tube Company was another cross-river industry which purchased land from O.J. Bailey, and at one time the Acme Manufacturing Company, whose business was that of railroad equipment, had also set up operation on the Farm Creek Fan. As industry grew, so did the demand for additional power facilities. In 1923, Silco expanded its operation with the construction of the steam generating station at the Farm Creek Fan. Along with supplying needed power to the growing industrial area west of the Four Corners, the R.S. Wallace Station made it possible for enterprising businessmen to develop the east side of the Four Corners with thriving commercial interests. W.F. Summerfield opened this general merchandise store in 1871. On summer afternoons, men would stop by for ice to cool their ice boxes. In winter, they would carry home coal for their pot-bellied stoves. Conversation could be had during any season of the year at this popular gathering place. Today, this hardware store, located just off the four corners in the heart of downtown East Peoria, is still operated by the Summerfield family. A young man, 25 years old, Mike Corey, opened this Peoria store in 1910. Thrifty shoppers could buy gunny sacks full of potatoes, onions by the barrel, and huge cartons of ginger snap cookies here, as well as at the new East Peoria store that Mike would open on Center in Washington in 1919. This store would eventually become Corey's Food Town, one of the oldest businesses in East Peoria today. At John Cray and Buell's Modern Market, an East Peorian could buy courtesy, cleanliness, and consideration for old or young. Like most of the local stores, Mr. Cranbuehl probably purchased his bread from East Peoria's own Bakerite Bakery, makers, naturally, of Bakerite bread. East Peorians needed a way to get around. The horse and buggy was definitely out. Enter the Ford sedan for only $645, or the Ford couplet for a low price of $580. Whatever your horseless carriage needs, the Dingledine Motor Company could provide East Peorians with the Ford of their dreams. A Ford Roadster from Dingledine Motor Company, priced at only $414, would have been the gift for the first graduates of East Peoria High School. Of course, there was local competition. Granted, the prices on Dingledine Fords were low. Nonetheless, William H. Shelm promised East Peorians a home on wheels with a Thede Brothers truck. Shelm's garage also specialized in hearses, ambulances, and combination service cars. Show me a horseless carriage and I'll show you a place to have it worked on. Besides the Shelm Garage, which did quite a lucrative business in auto repair, there were two other service garages located on East Washington, the Springfield Hill Garage and the A.D. Hill Service Station, who, by the way, did work for cash prices only. East Peoria was on the go, but they had not yet been exposed to the glory of the credit card. Some East Peorians didn't mind taking a walk now and then. They bought their shoes from the East Peoria Shoe Store, 123 East Washington Street, a friendly little store run by two East Peorians, F. Graff and J. Mosher. But where was there to go? Why, to the Four Corners, of course. A friendly stroll on a warm Sunday afternoon could end up at the J. Schmidt Store. East Peorians were invited to cool off here to quench their thirst with soda pop, ice cream, or fancy candies. Or a fellow might go to Roselle's Ice Cream Parlor 
a place where a young man could win a lady's heart by treating her to the order of the day, an ice cream soda. And if that didn't work, he might like to take the advice of the Dagaford Lumber Company. Make her happy. Build a home first. The Dagaford Lumber Company was one of the first suppliers of building materials to settle in East Peoria. In order to meet the demands of the growing population, many more suppliers, builders, and contractors came to the area. There was the Peoria Brick and Tile Company, located just three yards inside East Peoria. The Granite Block Company was responsible for the manufacturing of granite face building blocks, while East Peoria's largest builder of homes were the During Brothers. Once again, the expansion of the commercial and industrial areas encouraged Silco to increase its power facilities. Silco made additions to the R.S. Wallace Station in 1936, 1939, and 1949. Finally, in 1957, with the completion of the 100,000-kilowatt steam turbine generator, Silco had more than tripled its generating capacity. During this time of commercial and industrial development, East Peoria had erected its first city hall. This piece of land where the city hall stands today was donated to the community by none other than O.J. Bailey. The land was given for the city's use as long as the hall remained on the grounds. Apart from Cole and Bailey, other men continued to nurture the growth of East Peoria. In 1919, the village of East Peoria had become the city of East Peoria. Numerous men of business had founded thriving commercial enterprises along East Washington Street, while West Washington, toward the river, had become the site for several manufacturing concerns, not the least of which was the Holt Manufacturing Company, later to be named the Caterpillar Tractor Company. What had once been a swampy marshland was, by the early 1900s, a prosperous industrial site. The diking of the riverfront by Gene Brown, another prominent realtor, had afforded a barrier against flooding from the Illinois River. Meanwhile, Oliver Bailey and Brown had begun building those organizations which would eventually drain the area behind the dikes as well as straighten the meandering course of Farm Creek, thereby confining its waters during floods. By 1922, realtors, confident in the city's potential for growth, had begun to advertise land for the development of homes in the rich farmland south of the city. Yet, certain even as the city's prospects seemed, an event on a warm May afternoon in 1927 would serve to thoroughly drench the city's rising expectations. The flood of 1927 still lives in the memories of numerous present-day East Peorians. Uh, I was working at Caterpillar uh, Tractor Company at that time, and uh, about quitting time, uh, there was a big dark cloud came over, and things just almost got black outside. And uh, I hesitated to go home, but then it rained and rained. And then we heard that there was a cloud burst up uh, uh, in East Peoria someplace. So uh, I thought I had better go home. And, and I started out to go home, and I went down by uh, the Dagaford Lumber Company. And by that time, the water was running over the sidewalk uh, about uh, three or four inches deep. So we had to stay at Dagaford's to, uh, to uh, get out of the water. And we had to stay there about, oh, maybe two or three hours until, until the water went down. I tried to go home, and I find that uh, the water was so deep across the PNPU uh, switch tracks that uh, I had to wait a while longer until I could get across. And then... Uh, Finally, the, the water did go down then. Then we found out that there had, been, uh, uh, there had been a heavy rain, a cloud burst, up along Farm Creek. And the Farm Creek had overrun its banks. And uh, that's where this water was coming from. So uh, uh, I went on home. And it was about 8.30 or 9 o'clock when I got home that evening. Uh, but then we heard the reports of all the damage that had come in. And uh, the railroad tracks had been washed out, and, uh, and the debris, trees, and uh, uh, things was across the street. And down in Richland, uh, there was a big lake down there in the low places where the people lived. The water had come up in their homes, and, uh, and they had to be moved out. And then we also found out that the Caterpillar, where I worked, the water uh, came up to the workbench uh, level. And uh, there was a lot of cleaning to be done there. Machines had to be torn down and cleaned 
tractors had to be torn down and cleaned, and it was about three months until uh, the, the company was able to operate again. We spent the night at the East Perry High School. Mother had been attending a Home Bureau meeting there, and, and uh, many mothers were there with children attending the Home Bureau. And my sister was a baby, Sarah Jeanette, and the flood came, and the rains came, and the water rise, and <clears throat> we uh, had to spend the day there. Mm -hmm. There was food at the school, and uh, provisions were made for the people who were there. But later that night, Dad was able to get through the receded water, and he came after us by car. Brought us home, and when we got home about 2 o'clock, there was a family in our beds. They lived on Floyd Street, and he had brought them there, a family, a dad and mother, and a, two children. And uh, where they lived on Floyd Street was near the Central Junior High School, where the, old ball, where the new ball diamond is now. And that house still exists, and... Uh, there were many houses along there, several I should say, that had water. It came up to the bedspreads, about 10 inches up on the bedspread. So you know there was a lot of cleanup after all this in the homes. Now cleanup, I know, started the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, it had receded in some homes, according to my parents. Some of the property was being cleaned up the next day by hoses and water, and etc. Mm -hmm. uh, much debris was removed the next day. There was another house on East Washington in the 700 block, 723, that floated from the front of the lot to the back of the lot. Now that house is still there, and it's 723 and a half, Washington, and that house was raised and a basement put in after the flood. And uh, so it's interesting to know that some of these houses weren't completely demolished, as many of the pictures showed much damage. Oh, of course, a lot of people got so discouraged. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know I had one man, well, his name was Ritter, he had a he had a pattern shop back then. He was a fine pattern maker over there on Herschel, East Herschel. And, uh, of course, he was right in the flood. Come up to me, he says, if somebody give me $500, he says, I'll turn my mortgage over to him. He says, they can have that place, I'm getting out of town. I said, you just get on over there and start cleaning up. I said, somebody's going to take you up and you'll be sorry for it. Uh -huh. Well, he did. <laughs> well, there's a lot of them down in Richland there. Uh -huh. Their house was in water for days, you know. Uh -huh. And a lot of them just almost gave their property away. <laughs> then, and I know uh, old Father Fenton, he was a Catholic priest over here, See, money. down the four corners, and he come up to me, he said, Bill, oh, this is terrible. This is going to set East Peoria back to fire. I said, oh, now, Father, I said, you go back there to your church, and get on your knees and pray, because I said, in six months you won't even know there was a flood here in this town. <laughs> oh, I hope you're right, he says. <laughs> So once again, East Peorians were faced with the problems posed by this gentle brook that could, on the heels of a cloudburst, develop into a terrifying floodplain. Crouched low in the valleys of the numerous surrounding hills, the creek gathers the waters from the broad reaches of the upland farm plateau, draining them down the valley into the Farm Creek Fan and out into the Illinois River. The flood of 1927 impelled East Peoria businessmen to once more set about a problem-solving task the East Peoria Sanitary District was established, and through a five-point improvement program, it proceeded to straighten, widen, and deepen the Farm Creek Channel. But these efforts were only followed again by floods in 1943 and 1945. Floods which resulted in the suspension of the crucial work at the Caterpillar plant during the height of its wartime production efforts. These floods served to strengthen the resolve of local officials who eventually would bring about the participation of the federal government in a multi-million dollar flood control project. This, the Farmdale Dam, was one result of that project. Though dry most of the time, it can accommodate a 400-acre reservoir area when full. Other improvements were likewise designed to take the flash out of the floods that had so long threatened East Peoria residents. 
a companion to the Farmdale Dam, the Fond du Lac Dam, would serve to contain those floodwaters accumulating in the watershed west of Farm Creek. Those portions of Farm Creek and Coal Creek which passed through the city were to be channeled and paved with concrete. Deep canyons of steel reinforced walls would guide the floodwaters as it lashed its path through the heart of downtown East Peoria. The bridges that passed over the two creeks would be replaced. Completed in 1954, the whole system, the bridges, the two dams, and the miles of paved channels would cost over $11 million. Yet, at that cost, East Peorians would be finally rid of those swamp and flood problems looming so long over its history. The story of East Peoria's obstinate struggle to conquer those overwhelming odds and its subsequent development as a rigorous industrial center cannot be fully told without including the rise of the Caterpillar Tractor Company. In 1909, the Colleen Manufacturing Company declared bankruptcy. The Benjamin Holt Company of Stockton, Ohio, purchased the plant and building site. A prominent Peoria industrialist, Murray M. Baker, arranged a transaction which incorporated the Holt Caterpillar Tractor Company as a separate firm. Then, 16 years later, the Holt Company and the Best Tractor Company merged with one another to form the new Caterpillar Tractor Company. This booming giant of industry chose East Peoria as the location for its manufacturing and administrative headquarters. Mighty enterprises owe their existence not only to the giants of industry, but equally to the ordinary men and women of East Peoria. The first immigrants who carve their small farms from a difficult terrain, down to the modern-day factory employees taking pride in the quality of their daily work, have all played a vital role in the pageant of progress. For these our forebearers, and for we who follow, history has not been so much a time as it is a place. Time is a quantity as insubstantial as dust in the wind. But these places, they do remain. On this spot, a father may stand and say to his son, 100 years ago, your great-grandfather first set plow to this plain where now stands this school. Yet sadly, so little remains of this proud past. This little white church, St. Monica's, where our forefathers worshipped, is one of the few important landmarks left standing. Would not these children who long ago attended historic Roosevelt grade school feel a twinge of regret to discover that their fine old school building had disappeared to make way for an empty parking lot? So much beauty, so many things of historic significance have been allowed to slip from our grasp and disintegrate in the mist of time. While there's still time, 
Let us gather and preserve the treasured fragments of our past before they vanish into obscurity. Traces of our heritage are still to be found in the silent graveyards where stalwart pioneers lie sleeping. But even some of these show pitiful neglect. Here, where loving hands once tended this little family cemetery, these toppled headstones bearing the decaying names of settlers long ago are all but obliterated by the relentless encroachment of tangled weeds.